Welcome back, everyone. My name is Jim Goddard. I'm also with the Division of Water Rights. I uh, manage the well drilling and geothermal program here in the division, so I, I deal with uh, wells pretty much full time here. Um, well drilling can be boring into the ground, but sometimes talking about well drilling can be boring too. But keep in mind there are questions on the test on this segment, so. <laughs> it depends. You'll have to check that out. So, um, anyway, moving on, these are the topics that I wanted to discuss with you today. Um, basically, the well drilling situation in Utah, what's going on as far as well drilling, and probably more importantly, the well drilling permitting mechanisms. And we've talked a little bit throughout the day about those mechanisms, and I'll, I'll go over those a little bit and talk about a few more. In other words, how do you, how do you get a permit to drill a well? Where does that come from? And uh, what do you give the driller once you have that permit to get, get them started? So it's going to be talking about those mechanisms and processes to get a permit to drill a well, whether it's a water production well or some other type of non-production well. Um, and those can include well renovations, replacements, and abandonments, also non-production well permitting. I wanted to talk a little bit about pump installation requirements. Those are fairly new, so I wanted to make sure everybody understands what are, what's now required in terms of pump installation and, and licensing, and some of the general administrative and construction rules related to well drilling that you as maybe applicants or, or consultants or whatnot might be um, involved in with respect to well drilling. The Division of Water Rights is, is kind of unique with well drilling in the sense that we we not only regulate the drilling of wells, but we regulate the drillers as well, and we issue licenses to those drillers. It's unique in the sense that we're about the only licensing agency outside of the Division of Occupational and Professional Licensing. So they license pretty much every other occupation or profession, but as the Division of Water Rights, we also license well drillers um, exclusively. They don't have anything to do with the licensing of well drillers. And the main reason is because they're um, drilling into a very important protected resource of groundwater and, and the legislature felt that the state engineer was best suited to be able to regulate the drilling into that resource. So just uh, real quick to give you an idea of what's really happening in Utah as far as drilling. Um, right now, we have 158 licensed well drillers that we regulate and we license um, every two years. And associated with those licensed drillers, they have 138, uh, excuse me, 228 registered operators. And we also license 138 pump installers. So we regulate both the drilling of the well and pump installation of those um, within those wells also. Um, as far as what's being drilled, um, non-production wells annually we have on average about 1,500 non-production wells per year and 80% of those are heat pump wells which we regulate. Heat pump wells are the wells that are drilled in order to use the thermal energy of the groundwater to produce heating and cooling in buildings. So um, if you've seen those, a lot of new buildings, schools, public buildings, big commercial buildings will have hundreds of these borings drilled in the ground in loops going through those in order to produce heating and cooling in those buildings. So as for about the last 15 years, we've seen a, a big increase in the drilling of those type of wells, which we regulate. As far as production wells, annually there's about 350 per year, and that's since about 2008, since the economy crashed. Um, that has reduced down to about 350 production wells. You can see most of those are just small domestic irrigation stock wells. We have about 14% irrigation wells, 9% um, are exclusively stock wells, and you can see the distribution there. And as I mentioned, 70% of those are just small diameter, four to six inch um, small wells for domestic irrigation or stock. This graph kind of gives an illustration of of the distribution of production versus non-production wells over the last 12 or so years. The red illustrates the production wells and you can see um, before 2008 when the economy took a downturn we were getting almost a thousand production wells a year and that dropped off significantly and it's uh, only now in the last year or so that it started to pick up. Um, but about 10 years ago that's when we saw the big boom in heat pump well drilling because it's kind of a green energy 
Um, and there's also a lot of tax incentives for putting these systems in, and so we had a big increase in that until last year when it dropped almost by, um, by a factor of three. And then over a longer period of time, you can see there's been, a, this, these are, uh, this shows the distribution of production wells only. It doesn't show non-production wells, but you can see over time um, we've had huge increases, um, even over uh, 1,000 uh, per year, all the way down to what we're seeing now uh, of about 300, depending um, on those times. You can see in, in 88, 3, 88, that time frame, there was a big downturn that had to do not only with such wet years but also the economy was bad so you can kind of look at a lot of different factors as to why uh, drilling has either increased or decreased as far as how these wells are drilled the common drilling methods are um, listed here the most common in utah is air rotary that's the the system that uses the most recent and updated technology it's the fastest it can um, really drill and, and put in a, a very premium well. We also get a lot of cable tool drilling. That's the ancient method that was used by the Chinese thousands of years ago. It still applies today and it's still a good method. And um, unlike most states who have pretty much gone completely away from cable tool, we still have a significant number of wells drilled with that uh, methodology. And mud rotary and a few other types of uh, drilling methods are also used, but the most common, as I, I mentioned, is air rotary drilling. So moving, kind of, that, that gives you a background of the drilling that's occurring in Utah um, over time. Um, how, is, how is that done? How do you get a permit to drill a well? And that's what I wanted to go to next. Uh, there are many mechanisms to get a permit to drill a well, and basically, when we talk about a permit, what you need as an applicant to give to the driller is what's called a start card. And many of you have probably heard of that term. A start card is, um, back in the past, before about 15 years ago, it actually was a card. We would issue a card, about a three by five, and that's what you would give to the driller to start drilling. It's not a card anymore, it's just a regular full piece of paper, regular sized piece of paper, but we still call it a start card. And that's what you are given as an applicant when you receive a uh, permit to drill a well. And there's many mechanisms, and here's just a few of them listed here that have already been talked about. A lot of them have um, earlier today. The application to appropriate, once that's approved, a memo decision is issued, we will send out an approval letter with the start card um, so that you have that permit to drill. Change application, exchange, all of those uh, provide the same thing. Once that application has been approved uh, for a point of diversion to drill a new well, then you get that permit letter and a start card to go with it. Um, there's also provisional rush letter, and that's kind of a, a, a situations where you filed an application, but it hasn't been approved yet, but you want to start drilling for various justified, legitimate reasons. You want to start drilling before it's approved. Um, then there, there is a mechanism for that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, also, you, can get a, you need a permit to renovate a well, to replace a well, and also the permitting mechanism for non-production wells, such as test wells, monitor wells, cathodic protection wells, heat pump wells, dewatering wells, etc. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we regulate and what we don't with respect to that. So the process for a water right in order to get that has already been talked about and it will continue to be talked about. So I'm not really going to go into that um, as much because it's already been talked about. But as I mentioned, once that application has been approved and you go through this process, then you'll get the start card uh, that you can give to the driller in order to start drilling. So what is the fee for doing that? What are the fees for getting that well permit? Uh, as mentioned with the water right, it depends on the application and how much water you're planning on using. And depending on that, that's the fee that you would pay. So it's, it's entirely based on what the, the water right is, the amount of water that you plan on using. For non-production wells, there is no application fee. So those are free and there's no fee associated with that. And the same goes for renovate and replacement well applications. There's no fees associated with those. So getting into a little bit more detail about the processes 
for some of those that haven't already been talked about. I'm not going to talk about the applications to appropriate or change applications or those types of water right related applications, but some that probably won't be talked about that I'll cover here um, include this first one, the application to renovate. It's to renovate an existing well, basically to modify it, such as to deepen the well, to add a liner, to create screens or perforations, or to repair the casing, pitless adapter installation, repairing a seal, things like that that need to be actual modifications to the well itself. A renovate permit is required for that. It does not grant approval to replace the well. Uh, about 15 years ago, it was the same thing. If you got a renovate permit, it also allowed you to replace it if, if the renovate did not pan out. But unfortunately, we, we were losing track with so many of those knowing whether they were actually renovated or replaced that we separated the process. So you would have to get a separate approval to replace a well um, from this point on. As I mentioned, there's no fee. Um, one thing to be cautious of is we won't process those applications unless the title or the ownership is current um, on that. So that's one thing that could hold up these applications. Otherwise, um, if everything is current on the water right, these can take anywhere from same day to just a few days to process uh, and get them out the door. And it allows for repair, renovation, or deepening, as I mentioned, and you need a separate application to replace the well. Our, our policy has, has changed slightly um, recently with respect to when you would need a renovation, renovation permit or not. And that's, that policy changed with the um, implementation of our pump installer regulation and licensing. So um, some of the things that used to require a renovation, renovation permit are now covered under the pump installation rules and so it's not required. So this kind of gives an, a, an idea of, of when you would need a renovation permit and that's for deepening well repair, renovation, and any time the well itself is modified, that's when you would need a renovation permit. If you're cleaning the well, developing the well, disinfecting, testing, doing pump work, something that you're not actually modifying the well itself, that does not require a renovation permit, but it still requires the work be done by a licensed driller or pump installer, so it's still regulated work, it just needs to not have that renovate permit associated with it. And the licensed driller and pump installer still needs to submit a report back to us when they're finished with that work. So we still track it and we, we still monitor that. But the applicant doesn't need to file a renovation for those type of activities. Um, that, that's what the, it's a one page form, real easy to fill out. It's on our forms page on the website. James showed you that, so it's easy to get to. You can fill it out online, print it. Um, send it in to us uh, or bring it in to us. A very simple process. Um, application for well replacement. Um, same, same kind of process. There's no fee. There's a form on our web page. Um, this, the, according to the statute, this application only applies if you're replacing the well within 150 feet of the existing well. If you go beyond 150 feet, then you fall into a change application process and you wouldn't be able to file a replacement well application. The owner, again, is responsible to have the licensed driller abandon the existing well. So if we approve an, a replacement well application, one of the conditions of that approval is that the old well will need to be abandoned because when we approve a replacement application, it, that process moves the water right to, from the existing well to the new well. So that old well no longer has a water right associated with it and it needs to be abandoned unless, um, unless you wanted to file a change application to leave a portion of your water in the existing hole or uh, maybe convert it to a monitoring well or some other type of use. But otherwise, the condition is on that approval that it be abandoned. Um, there's no fee and again, the title and ownership needs to be current for us to process that. Um, and uh, we track both the well log and abandonment log. So when we issue that approval and uh, give the start card out and you give the start card to the driller and they notify us that they're starting, we send that driller an abandonment log for the old well and we track that to make sure we get it back. And if you or the, if the applicant refuses to have the driller abandon that old well, then the, the driller is obligated to notify us and they send back that abandonment log and tell us that that, uh, that well is still out there unabandoned and then we'll follow up from our end. 
And similar type of form, that's what it looks like. Again, it's on our forms page, real easy to find. Um, just real quick on the well abandonment process, um, our, our statute or our rules um, indicate wells need, when we call a well abandoned, it's not that we just leave it alone and don't worry about it anymore. Our definition of abandonment is to seal it from bottom to top with approved sealing material, which can be cement, sand cement, bentonite uh, material, and it has to be done by a licensed driller. So that's, that's what the requirement is. Well abandonments um, have to be done by a licensed driller. They can't be done just by the well owner because of the process going through and the, the notification needed. Um, there, there's two types of, of abandonments, um, temporary versus permanent. Temporary is a case where um, you may start drilling a well and you run out of money or you, you need to reevaluate the design and so you have to temporarily put a hold on that well um, and that temporary hold can be as long as 90 days according to the rules. Anything beyond that, the well would have to be either finished, completed, or permanently abandoned. And permanently abandoned means, like I said, sealing it up permanently with sealing materials. So when a well was, is replaced, um, the old well, it's an, the abandonment is a condition of the approval for a standalone abandonment. What standalone means is it's not related to a replacement well. It's, you, you have an old well, you wanted to abandon it. It's not related to any kind of an application. You just need to get rid of it so it's no longer a source of contamination. And so the process for that is there's no uh, permit to do a standalone abandonment that you need. You just need to have a licensed driller do it and that licensed driller knows what notification needs to be done. They call us and let us know that it's going to be abandoned and we send that driller an abandonment log to fill out. Um, so that, that's the process for a standalone abandonment. <clears throat> Applications for non-production wells. So these type of wells include test wells. Uh, what a test well is, is a well that's not associated with a water right application. Um, and, and this is on a non-production well um, application. Uh, a test well is just what it is. You want to test to find whether there's sufficient water or the water quality is, is adequate. Um, or you, you just want to find the water. And typically these are small diameter wells. You're trying to uh, find an aquifer, find uh, sufficient water, and it's typically temporary. It's small diameter. You're, once you're finished, you either convert it to a monitoring well or you abandon it, and that's how we define a test well. And uh, there, there has been some confusion between a test well and what we call a provisional or a rush letter well where you want to drill a production well before an application is approved, a water right application is approved, and so um, you can get a provisional um, rush approval, but that's a different process. It's not included under the, the test well. So we, we have some issues with people trying to submit drilling a production well on a non-production well application. And we, we look at those pretty closely to try to weed those out to make sure they're done on the right. Uh, usually what we do is look at, and if on the non-production well application they say they're going to drill a thousand foot well, with 20, 20 inch diameter casing, that pretty much tells us it's not a test well, it's a production well. But if they're drilling a thousand foot well that's six inch or four inch, yeah, that's probably going to be a test well. And not. You have to be notified if you're going to drill a test well. Do you get notification of a test well? Yeah, so the question is are we notified if um, a test well is drilling? is going to be drilled and the, the answer is yes we're notified because to drill a test well you have to have a permit to drill a test well so to do a test well you have to fill out a non-production application we issue an approval letter and start cards it's the same kind of the same process as a production well at that point you get the start card you give it to the driller the driller notifies us they they go through the same process so some of the other types of wells that we regulate, non-production wells, cathodic protection wells, closed loop heat exchange wells, and monitoring wells are a few. Um, the, there is no fee for non-production wells. And typically they're either processed through my program here in Salt Lake or any of the regional offices can process those non-production um, non well um, applications. In some cases, by rule, we have up to 14 days to review those before we approve them, but generally they're approved just like the other replacement and renovate, same day or very close to that. 
That rule was updated recently in order to give us opportunity in very populated areas that have um, groundwater that is um, a little um, susceptible to contamination like Salt Lake Valley where somebody wants to come in and drill um, 300 heat pump wells right next to a big production well which has happened and that's kind of why this is took place and that production well was contaminated by those and so this 14 day review period will allow people like public suppliers to see what's going on in their area and to know whether they need to protest or um, make issue with some of these applications. Um, and, and as I was mentioning, the provisional wells um, or the rush letter wells, um, these are permission to drill a production well um, before the water right application is approved. And it's granted the owner, at the owner's risk. If the application is denied, then it would be up to the owner to abandon that well. It gives authorization, authorization to drill, construct, and test, but not to put into production or beneficial use. It is linked to a water right application, so there's no separate application. If you file the water right application, then you would uh, basically request in writing to the regional engineer or whoever you're dealing with in our office that you want um, to drill this um, provisional well, and you have to have justification to do that. So the owner files that application and then submits the written request to us. Um, the statute, um, this, is, this is what the statute is. It's in section 33-3-5, subparagraph 4, and it, it, it kind of lays out what our statutory requirement is for giving that temporary uh, permit to drill before an application is, is actually approved. So real quick, I'm not going to go into the well drilling rules. If you're interested in knowing specifically um, of the well drilling rules, we, we give regular classes to our well drillers and, uh, and engineers and consultants and geologists on well drilling rules. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I can let you know when those are coming up. But we do have a set of rules. It's R655-4 specific to well drilling if you're interested. And just so you understand the scope of those rules and, and when they would apply, it's basically any well that's deeper than 30 feet, any type of water production well deeper than 30 feet are permitted through us and those in, and regulated through us. And you can see the listing there, domestic all the way down, any type of well that would be associated with a water right, we regulate. Um, with these rules that are deeper than 30 feet. Just, um, just so you know, and we get this confusion quite often is, well, if my well is less than 30 feet, does that mean I don't have to have a water right? And the answer is absolutely not. You, you have to have a water right regardless of whether it's surface water, shallow groundwater, or deep groundwater. The only 30 foot distinction is with the well drilling rules themselves. If it's less than 30 feet, you don't have to have a licensed driller do it and you don't have to follow the well drilling rules. So you can, do, you can dig a well um, yourself if it's less than 30 feet. So um, another caution, if you ever work with a well driller, never call them a well digger. They don't like that anymore. So. And then non-production wells that we regulate. Again, anything over 30 feet, um, uh, and we permit those through the non-production well process. And they can include test wells, monitoring wells, and you can see I've already talked about many of those type of wells. The wells that are excluded from the rules that we do not regulate, um, anything less than 30 feet. Geothermal wells are not included in these well drilling rules. However, we do regulate them at the Division of Water Rights, but there's another set of rules, R655-1, and we as a division regulate those separately from the water well drilling rules. We do not regulate exploratory or geotechnical borings or structure monitoring wells if they're um, not impacted by an aquifer or dewatering wells if not impacting an aquifer. If they do impact an aquifer, then we would regulate those just like a non-production well. So anything, when, when we talk about exploratory, that includes oil, gas, mining type wells because they're regulated through another state agency, so we don't regulate those. It's important to understand the definition of well drilling. It's, it's uh, in other words, well, that definition basically tells us what we can regulate and what we can't. And the definition of that means the act of drilling, constructing, repairing, renovating, deepening, cleaning, 
developing or abandoning a well. And as of 2011, it also now includes pump installation and repair work, uh, which we now started to regulate since 2011. And some of the administrative rules, which I'm really not going to go into very much, but as I was mentioning, we license the drillers. Um, they, they have some fairly strict requirements that they have to go through as far as keeping that license and, and what they can do um, on the site. And we have a process to um, issue violations and potentially put them on probation, suspend their license, and revoke their license, which, which unfortunately we've had to do from time to time, not very often though. Um, and they have specific reporting requirements. They have to submit the start card to us before they start drilling. They have to submit a well log to us 30 days after completion. Um, and that log is specific for each well. They have to submit pump logs if they do pump work or any of those other activities regulated under the pump rules. Um, they have to submit abandonment reports when they abandon a log. Uh, and then the applicant card, and this is good to know, when we issue a permit to drill, you get the, the approval letter, the start card, and another form, which is the applicant card. So the, the start card you give to the driller, the applicant card you keep as the applicant, and when the well is done, you fill it out, send it back to us. And that just gives us an idea of when the well was completed so that we can expect that well log. There's, there's really no obligation on the applicant for turning that in. If you don't turn it in, there's no penalty or anything like that. It just helps us to know uh, and to track those well logs and when they come in. So real quick on pump installation, this is a, the proper way to install a pump in Utah. Just kidding. Uh, real quickly on pump installation rules, um, a license is required if you do, if, if that work is done professionally for compensation. So if you hire a pump installer, they have to have a license to do it. Um, there is an exception that the legislature put in there to where if you're doing your own work on your own well on your own property, you don't have to have a license. So you can still do that work on your own well. That doesn't apply to drilling. Whether it's on your own property or your own well or not, you have to have a licensed driller drill your well. But if uh, it's on your own property, you can do that work yourself. Wouldn't recommend it unless you know pumps and, and what not. But um, anyway, there is that exemption. There's no permit or start card needed for pump work. Uh, but there is a pump log that the driller or pump installer needs to submit when they're finished. And that gets put on the file. Just real quick, if you're doing public supply wells, there is another agency that regulates those, not us. We, we regulate public supply wells with our rules, but there's another layer on top of ours, and that's through the Division of Drinking Water, and they have some additional requirements that they um, have for public supply wells. None of this is on the test, but I just wanted to make sure you knew um, what those are, because some people get caught thinking they have a water right and a permit to drill, and then they go forward and, and drill this well, realizing that, oh, um, our requirement is a 30-foot seal, but if it's a public supply well, it has a 100-foot seal, and you've already only put in a 30-foot seal, and it's very difficult to go back after the fact and, and renovate that. Some of the construction requirements um, are listed there. None of these are on the test. I just wanted to show you real quick um, what all that we regulate, anything from the casing to screens, the surface seals, um, anything that would cause potential contamination to the resource or to you as the applicant or owner of a well, we try to regulate to make sure that that's done properly by the driller. So a well is more than just a hole in the ground. It's, it's a very complex um, engineered structure in most cases. And if it's not done properly, then it could not only harm you as an owner, but harm the, the aquifer in general. So just real quick. You do? <laughs> You've seen it? I don't know if I can. Oh, how do I get? There we go. James probably wasn't going to go into this in a lot of detail, so I just, in, in one minute, I was going to show you on our web page all the information that's available on our, through the well drilling program. A couple ways to get there, as James said, if you go to programs and then well drilling, or just right here in the center, 
um, under well drilling if you click on that. But a lot of information here. If you want to know the rules, there's a PDF you can download right here. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, licensed drillers, this, this is all available. You can go and look at all the currently licensed drillers. If you drill into those, you can see contact information, phone numbers, all the wells that they're currently working on and all the wells that they've done in the past uh, for that licensed driller. So all that information is there. Um, so for example, all wells, you can see their contact information, maybe even a picture of their, um, their rig. It has all of the, the information on where they're currently drilling and everything that they've drilled. And if you click on the date, you can access their well log. So you can pull well logs real easy from that. Um, this drop down box, if you want to search by name or number instead of company name, or you can look specifically at licensed pump installers, or if you want to find a driller that's no longer licensed, um, we have those lists or a registered operator. So all that information is there. We have the rules you can access. If you want to search well logs, uh, you can find that here. Location search, you can search by um, section, township, and range, or UTMs, and you can put in search criteria, like if you want to look at a certain depth range, or dates, or diameters, or type of well, you can do searches that way. So very powerful there. Or if you want to use the map view like, like uh, James was showing, where you can turn on a, um, one of those layers that only shows well logs instead of points of diversion, you can do that. Um, <clears throat> statistics, some of those statistics I showed you are pulled from this. You can find different uh, statistics about well drilling. Probably the most common one is types of wells, and it give you, it'll give you the number the distribution of both production and non-production wells. And if you want to look at it, those specifically, you can click on um, any of those and it will give you a list of actually what those are and you can go directly to that, um, those permits. So a lot of good information there as far as drilling statistics um, and, and other things, contacts, um, well drilling links if you're interested, um, all of the agency links that regulate well drilling in Utah and nationally. Um, also, well owner information. If you want to just learn about how wells are drilled, there's some good links here to sites that uh, give it a good idea of how wells are, are drilled. So with that, um, I've, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm going to close. But uh, I'll be around for a little bit, so if anybody has any questions afterwards, I'll um, be happy to ask them. But thank you very much. So it wasn't that boring, was it? No. <laughs>